Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, it's just a delight to be here this afternoon. Um, thank you for the opportunity. I don't think I've ever preached in with such a huge big screen behind me. I feel like a <laughs> movie star or something. It's just, do we dim the lights and watch the, t- watch the video or something? Um, no, it's just, it's just great. And thank you for the opportunity to be here. Yeah, um, this is the beginning of our third year in the conference. And because there's about 85 or so congregations, it's just there's limited Sabbaths to get around and, and visit, but uh, we're delighted to be here this afternoon with you. Um, let's just pause for another word of prayer, if that's all right. Father in heaven, as we open your word now, we just invite your spirit again to be here. Thank you for your Sabbath. Thank you for this opportunity to worship you. May you speak through me and uh, speak to us this afternoon, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. He was born in Portsmouth in England on the 13th of April 1949. His parents were not wealthy, but at an early age his mother said, if there is going to be an upper class, then my son is going to be part of it. His parents separated while he was still quite young. He was educated at Mount House School in Devon and then went to several private colleges for his high school training. In 1970, he graduated from Oxford University with a particular interest in philosophy, politics and economics. He spent most of his life as a journalist and a writer of books and columns for such magazines as Vanity Fair. He was in constant demand as a speaker on television, radio and other debating platforms. Along with Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett and Sam Harris, you know, (laughs) Christopher Hitchens has been described as one of the four horsemen of the new atheism movement. Now in Revelation chapter 6, we have the four horsemen of the apocalypse or the book of Revelation. And each one of them has a different colour. We've got a white horse, we have a red horse, we have a pale horse and we have a black horse. But these four gentlemen have been described as the four horsemen of the new atheism movement or the neo-atheism movement. On a publicity tour in 2010 for his memoir, a book that he wrote called Hitch 22, Christopher Hitchens learned that he had esophageal cancer. During his life, he was a heavy smoker and a heavy drinker, but he professed that he had no regrets about his lifestyle. In one of of his last interviews for the BBC, he was asked if he was afraid to die. His reply, you can't live your life without fear. It's a question of what is your attitude towards it. He said, I'm not afraid of death as such, but I'm afraid that I might die in an ugly or squalid way. I don't have a sense of waste or a sense of betrayal of my family. I didn't pick this fight, but I'm in it. Christopher Hitchens died on Thursday, December 15, 2011. He was an aggressive and devout atheist. In a speech, he said, I'm absolutely convinced that the main source of hatred in the world is religion, organised religion. He said the Bible is a fabrication, it's a fantasy. In 2007, he wrote this best-selling book, God is not God, little g, is not great with the subtitle, How Religion Poisons Everything. Anyone read this book? One person? Okay. I found it a real challenging book to read. Um, Certainly wouldn't recommend it for bedtime reading for your children. But, um, yeah, it will challenge your thinking. In this book, he gives dozens of reasons why not to believe in God and the Bible. He spends a great deal of time looking at the sinister things that people purportedly do in the name of religion. 
And we would have to admit that there are many of them. Something that hasn't helped is that since he's written this book and since he's been involved in public lecturing and debates and so forth, he has received hate mail, hate email and even death threats from so-called religious and even Christian people because of his views. Here's something to mull over, over a refreshments after the service. Is it all right to send hate mail or email to somebody who's an atheist, if you're a Christian? No. Let me just share with you a couple of um, quotes from the book that I found quite sobering to read. Chapter 2 is entitled, Religion Kills, and he writes this, Imagine that you can perform a feat of which I am incapable Imagine, in other words, that you can picture an infinitely benign and all-powerful creator who conceived of you and then made and shaped you, brought you into the world that he made for you and now supervises and cares for you even while you sleep. Imagine further that if you obey the rules and commandments that he has lovingly prescribed, you will qualify for an eternity of bliss and repose. I do not say that I envy you this belief because to me, he writes, it seems like the wish for a horrible form of benevolent and unalterable dictatorship. But I do have a sincere question. Why does such a belief not make its adherents happy? It's a fair question, isn't it? Why does such a belief not make its adherents happy? Are Christians happy? Should they be? He goes on, he writes that he became a member of the Greek Orthodox Church. The only reason he became a member of the church was so that he could marry his wife, who was a member of the Greek Orthodox Church. And you had to be a member to marry somebody of that particular persuasion. But he found out afterwards that the archbishop who conducted the service was an enthusiastic cheerleader and fundraiser for his fellow Orthodox Serbian mass murderers, Radovan Karadzic and Ratko Mladic, who filled countless mass graves all over Bosnia. You can understand why he became cynical. One of the things that he looks at in the book is the religious conflicts or the, the conflicts that we see around the world on our nightly television news programs. And he says so many of these conflicts are there because people have religious differences. Now, some of them are there for religious differences, but I would argue not all. But he said, just take one letter of the alphabets and think about the cities that begin with that letter and think about the conflicts in those cities and how many of them have a religious foundation. He says, let's just take the letter B, for example. Belfast, Beirut, Bombay, Belgrade, Bethlehem, and Baghdad. How many of those conflicts have a religious foundation in those places? My wife and I, a few years back, had the privilege of walking the streets of Belfast. It's a sobering place to be. Sobering. And he writes this, in Belfast, I have seen whole streets burned out by sectarian warfare between different sects of Christianity and interviewed people whose relatives and friends have been kidnapped and killed or tortured by rival religious death squads, often for no other reason than membership of another confession. True? True? It's true. We have to be honest enough to admit that that's true. He looks at people who have made startling predictions about the end of the world and even set dates and those events haven't happened. Now, a year or two back, a um, year or two ago, there was a guy in America who made a prediction that, was it in uh, February or March of the year, that the world was going to come to an end and Jesus was going to come? And then it didn't happen, so he reset the date for September or something that year. 
And he's not the only one. Many, many times people have made predictions about the end of the world and, and set dates, and we're still here. He makes an interesting comment along these lines. He says, people have sold their homes, their businesses, had families torn apart because they, re- they joined a religious sect or a group led by someone, someone claiming to be a prophet or a leader. Are you familiar with the great American religious revival that happened in the early 1800s? I'm sure some of you are. William Miller, is that name familiar to you? He writes this, and I quote, In 1844, one of the greatest American religious revivals occurred, led by a semi-literate lunatic named William Miller. Mr. Miller managed to crowd the mountaintops of America with credulous fools who, having sold their belongings cheap, became persuaded that the world would end on October 22 of that year. They removed themselves to high ground. What difference did they expect that to make? Or to the roofs of their hovels. When the ultimate failed to arrive, Miller's choice of terms was highly suggestive. He, it was, he announced, the great disappointments. And then he goes on to talk about how Lindsay and the predictions that he has made. My point is this, these men, Dawkins, Dennett, Harris and Hitchens and others like them are aggressively pushing their views and thoughts on society as a whole. You notice, you may not be able to see it, but this is a New York this, this book was on the New York um, number one best-selling list for quite some time. They are writing these bestsellers that millions of people around the world are reading. They are lecturing in the universities. They are the ones on the TV talk shows, doing the radio interviews. They are the ones leading out in the public lectures and the, and the debates. It's the views of these men and others like them that are being soaked up by educators and teachers and lecturers and students and then being passed on to the next generation. And here's the good news. Some of what they say is true. So many people have given religion and even Christianity a bad name. There are those who do things in the name of religion that are abhorrent And they are on the news at the moment and being exposed through the Royal Commission into child sexual abuse that is currently going on here in Sydney. Can I go a step further? There are some things in the Bible that are not easy to explain or even understand. At times, there even seems to be contradictions. At times, it's hard to explain why God asks people to do some of the things that he does ask people to do. At times, he seems like a judgmental dictator who orders the killing of other people, and yet we have a commandment that says, what? Thou shalt not kill. What do we do with those two things? How do we put them together? It's not easy to understand or explain. Some of the events that occur are hard to believe. They almost seem bizarre in some of the passages of Scripture. Let me give you one example. Judges 15. Samson, you remember, if you know the story, was upset with the Philistines. So he goes out, the Bible says, and catches 300 foxes, ties their tails together, attaches a lighted torch, and lets them run through the grain fields of the Philistines and sets fire to the whole lot's. Just, to, just when those fields are ready for harvest. Anyone here caught a fox by hand? Yeah, dangerous business, it would be. Have you ever tried? Do you think that you could? Apparently, somehow, Samson went out and caught 300 of them. But how would you keep 250 foxes under control while you went out and got number 251? But that's what the Bible says, and it says it's a literal story. It's not a parable. It's not written in poetry. It's written in prose. The Bible says that that's what Samson did. 
you can understand why somebody reading that for the first time would question, did it really happen? Or was it just a nice parable to tell a, or make a particular point? Fortunately, if you do your homework, the Hebrew word for foxes and jackals is the same word. Now, my research tells me that jackals travel around in packs and they're very much easier to catch. And it could be that that's what Samson used. Or maybe somebody back there bred foxes and had them in a confined space and Samson was able to deal with it fairly easily. It is possible. But you can understand why some people question some of the stories written in the Bible. Again, here's my points. If we think that everything in this book is just black and whites, if we think that everything is easy to explain, that it's simple to understand, I would suggest that we need to think again. What is arguably, I believe, one of the best little devotional books ever written is this little book, written by Ellen White, a religious leader in the last uh, previous century, Steps to Christ. Some of you read this book? Um, beautiful little book. One of the, the best devotional books on how to have a relationship with God. And it's just, um, just fantastic. But interestingly enough, in, um, in this little book, Ellen White has a chapter called What to Do with Doubts. Now, why would she put that chapter in this little book? Let me just share a paragraph or two from um, that chapter. She says, she says this, Many, especially those who are young in the Christian life, are at times troubled with the suggestions of scepticism. There are in the Bible many things which they cannot explain or understand. How many? Just a few? There are many things that are not easy to understand or explain in Scripture. And I'll make a suggestion as to why that is in a little bit. And Satan employs these to shake their faith in the Scripture as the revelation of God. She goes on to say, It is impossible for finite minds fully to comprehend the character of the works of the Infinite One. The Word of God, like the character of its divine author, presents mysteries that can never be fully comprehended by finite beings. The entrance of sin into the world, the incarnation of Christ, regeneration, the resurrection, and many other subjects presented in the Bible are mysteries too deep for the human mind to explain or even fully to comprehend. It's not going to happen, she says. This is where I have a philosophical problem with thinkers like Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins. Their preposition is that if it can't be explained, if it can't be fully understood, if it can't be tested by science or witnessed firsthand, then either it didn't happen or you shouldn't believe in it. If you can't prove it, throw it out. They claim that science has proved that the Bible is a fabrication, a total human construct. My contention and the contention of many others is that science is great. It's fantastic. It has improved our standard of living immensely. It has led to so many amazing discoveries. But science is not everything there is. There's something outside of that. Some of the most fundamental questions cannot be answered by science. Questions of meaning, questions of purpose. What is love? How, do we, how is it that we have a conscience? Why is it that we recoil when we see on the news that some little old lady living on her own, who's a beautiful person in the community, her house has been robbed and ransacked and she's been raped. Why is it that our hearts get ripped out when we hear something like that happening, where does that come from? What about morality? What is the purpose of life? Does life have any meaning? They are fundamental questions that we seek answers to 
And sometimes science can't answer, doesn't have anything to contribute in those areas. Someone once said, science can tell you how to build a nuclear bomb, but it can't tell you how to use it. It's not a bad summary, is it? Science can tell you how to build a nuclear bomb. It can't tell you how to use it. If you have your Bibles or um, your electronic devices, I invite you to turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. Very significant passage here. You may have read it before, I'm sure you have. 1 Peter chapter 3, right toward the back of the Bible. We'll pick it up in verse 13. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. And I'm reading from the New King James. I just like this translation for my uh, study and my devotional reading. 1 Peter chapter 3, reading from verse 13. Right toward the back of the Bible. You've got 1st and 2nd Peter and then 1st, 2nd and 3rd John, then Jude and Revelation. And they're just little books. So right toward the back of the Bible. 1st Peter chapter 3, reading from verse 13. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats or be troubled. Verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts And I'd really like us to notice the next bit. What does it say? Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. But notice the next little bit. Do it with what? My version says meekness and fear or respect. Our job is not to hit people over the head with the Bible or with with the things that we believe. It's to do it gently with meekness and respect. Peter goes on, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good, your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. Verse 17, for it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Let me just make three little points. Firstly, God is not afraid of questions. And if we have questions, if we have doubts, and I'm sure all of us at some point in our lives have done or will do or currently do have, because as we have said, there are so many things in Scripture that are not easy to understand or explain. I try to read the Bible through in, in my devotional life. Um, you know, some people have favorite books or whatever. I'm a boring, old, methodical person. I like to start at the beginning and read the Bible right through. I'm in the, uh, the Minor Prophets, the last part of the Old Testament at the moment. And some parts of the Bible you think, oh, Father, this is heavy going. I'm really struggling to get something beneficial out of this chapter or this passage or whatever. Some parts of the Bible are like that. And it's interesting to note that as you read the Bible stories, people who wrote the Bible or who feature in the Bible had had some similar issues. There are people that God asked and called to jobs and they said, God, this is too hard. I don't understand what you're asking me to do. Or I just, I'm over this. I just want to give up, take my life. There are people who got to that point in their lives and say, God, I can't do this anymore. And they called out to God, they cried out to God, they shed their tears and their frustration. It's okay. God is a big God. He can handle all of that. He's not phased by our questions or by our doubts. He's a big God. The Bible says that in Isaiah, God inhabits eternity. Nothing too big for Him. And if we have doubts, let's not run away from them. Let's not try to push them down into some corner. Let's be open and honest with each other and with God and say, God, there's parts of the Bible or there's parts of this that I just don't understand. God is not afraid of questions. Ask Him. Talk to Him. Ask other people that you trust. God can take it. He's a big God. If truth is truth. And folk, I believe with all my heart and all my being that this book is the Word of God and it contains 
his truth. If truth is truth, it will stand up to investigation. And if it doesn't, let's not believe it. It may not be popular, and those who believe in it may not be in the majority, but it will stand up. Ellen White says in that chapter, and if, I actually have a couple of these at home, if anyone doesn't have a copy of Steps to Christ and would like this one, I'm happy to, to, uh, to give it to you. She says in that same chapter, God never asks us to believe without giving sufficient evidence upon which to base our faith. His existence, his character, the truthfulness of his word are all established by testimony that appeals to our reason. These guys, these atheists, are saying, if you believe, you're just taking some giant dark le uh, leap into the darkness. That is not true. She says the, the, the testimony in Scripture appeals to our reason and this testimony is abundant. Yet God has never removed the possibility of doubt. Our faith must rest upon evidence, not demonstration. Those who wish to doubt will have opportunity, while those who really desire to know the truth will find plenty of evidence on which to rest their faith. It's there if we look for it. Let me give you just a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, thoughts that might help. Evidence, and this is not fabrication, this is not some fairy story, this is not some parable, this is fact. Why is it that the Bible is history's all-time best-selling book? Why is it that more copies of the Bible have been printed than any other book in history on the face of the earth? Is that just luck? Is that just coincidence? Why is that? Why is it that people will do anything, they'll be desperate to get a, a copy of the Bible, portions of the Bible. You read through, through history before the advent of the printing press and the, the, the lengths that people went to to get a portion of the Bible, they treasured it like gold. People died to get parts of the Bible so that they could read it for themselves. Why is that? Just because it's some fantasy? Some fairy story? Why is it that the Bible has been translated into more languages than any other book in the history of human, of human race? What about archaeological evidence? What about fulfilled prophecies? Micah, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, 500 years before it happened, predicted the very village that Jesus would be born in. How did he know that? Any scholar knows, any person reading the Bible knows that Micah was written 500 years before the birth of Jesus. Pinpointed the very village. Was that just a good guess? What about the influence of culture, the influence of, of Christianity and the Bible on culture and art and society? What about the two holidays that are celebrated right around the world, Christmas and Easter? What are they about? Where have they come from? Why do we celebrate them? The Bible has impacted our lives more than what sometimes we think. There is evidence there if we're prepared to look for it. But if we have questions, if we have doubts, let's not run away from them. God is not afraid of questions. Point two, read and study for yourself. In 2007, Richard Dawkins published his best-selling book, The God Delusion. I've read parts of it, I haven't read all of it. Some of you may have read it. Interestingly enough, as a, uh, a counter to that, um, and it's a little bit hard to see on the screen, David Belinsky, who's a secular Jew, not a Christian that I'm aware of, a secular Jew, wrote a rebuttal to Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, called The Devil's Delusion. Atheism, the subtitle is Atheism and its Scientific Pretensions. And in this book, he argues that science does not support atheism if you push it to its logical conclusions. Atheists argue that there is no God 
Francis Collins, some of you may have read this one, The Language of God. Who was Francis Collins? Francis Collins was head of the, uh, head of the group of scientists who mapped for the very first time in about 2001 the entire human genome. One of the world's leading scientists wrote this book, The Language of God, argues in this book, and while I don't agree with everything that Francis Collins writes, argues in this book that when we look at the workings and the design of the human cell, that there's no possible way that that could have arisen by chance or natural selection. No possible way. Anthony Flew wrote this book. There is, interesting title, originally, There is No God, right out the, uh, struck out the word no and put, in, put the word a in, how the world's most notorious, ace, no, notorious atheist changed his mind. Interesting read. Now, we need to remember, folk, that these people are not members of the Seventh-day Adventist Christian Church or the Baptist Church or whatever. They haven't got an axe to grind. These men are some of the world's leading scientists. Bright minds. And they have looked at both sides of the argument and come to the conclusion to the conclusion that the weight of evidence falls on the side of the existence of God. Point two, read and study for yourself. Point three, I believe that we do need to admit that we are never going to have all of the answers to all of the questions that we have this side of the second coming of Jesus. Questions will remain. We are going to need to exercise a certain degree of faith. There is a part that will never be proved beyond all uncertainty, a part that you can't take into, lo into our laboratory and test. The reason? We are finite. God is infinite. If we were to know as much as God does, we would be equal or better than He is, and that's not going to happen. Well, certainly not to me. That was the reason for the great controversy in the, in the first place, that Lucifer was not content with the position that God gave him. And he says, I want to be like God's. I want to, I want to sit on his throne. I want to exalt myself. It's all about the big eye. We're not going to know as much as God does. It's just not going to happen. Some people don't like that idea. Some people can't live with it. They don't like the fact that someone is bigger than they are or there's somebody who knows more than they do. Or as you read some of the material from Christopher Hitchens and Dawkins and some of these guys, the thing that comes through that I've found over and over and over again is that there are people who don't like to know that they might be accountable to somebody else. And for these guys... As I see it, in my personal humble opinion, that's the bottom line. This is my life and I'll live it how I want and I won't be accountable to anybody for anything. But folk, if we take God out of the equation, if we take God out of society, pity help us. A godless society is a road to destruction. You look at the French Revolution you look at communist regimes where tens of millions of people have been slaughtered. Find out the results of a society who lives without God. Here's my challenge. Are you, am I, prepared to stand up and be counted as Bible-believing Seventh-day Adventist Christians? If that's what we claim to be in the face of huge opposition, pressure, or even ridicule. 1 Peter 3.17 talked about suffering. It's better to suffer for doing good or for being, being a believer in God than it is for doing evil. Now, I don't particularly like that verse because I don't like pain. <laughs> Not too many of us do, right? We avoid it at all costs. I don't want to suffer, but if God allows me to experience a degree of suffering... Am I prepared to continue to stand or will I cave in and go with the crowd, the majority? 
take the easy way out. Think that it won't really matter. After, after all, God knows my heart. On the plain of Jura, in the province of Babylon, over 2,500 years ago, three men were put in such a situation. You know the story. Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar has that dream. You remember, he sees the big image, the head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet and toes. He says, no, I'm the king here. I'm the one who's the ruler. And so what does he do in chapter 3? He builds a big statue that mirrors the dream in chapter 2, but what's different about it? It's all of gold. The whole thing is about him and his kingdom. And then just so he gets the point, you remember he calls the musicians together and he says, when you guys play and brings all of the people together, when the music plays, everyone bows down to this image. And if you don't, well, we'll just have a nice little bonfire over here for you to think about, help you, encourage you to be motivated. You remember the story? You remember there was three, at least three men that we know about whether there was others, we're not sure. The Bible doesn't tell us, but there were three men who refused to bow down to that image that he'd set up. Nebuchadnezzar is a fair man. He says, okay, give you another chance. Gets the orchestra to start playing again. The same men continue to stand, refuse to bow down. Word gets back to Nebuchadnezzar. He's absolutely furious. He's in a rage. He says, build the bonfire up, put some more fuel on it, get the big blowers out, make it seven times hotter. Some of the men who did that died themselves. The Bible records that those three men are brought to Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 3. And I just, I I just so, I'm just so inspired by, by what they said to this king, this pagan king who had absolute power and authority. Daniel chapter 3, we find it from verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, they were respectful, right? O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. Reading Daniel chapter 3 verse 16. And now verse 17. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. Verse 18. But if not... Let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. I pray for courage and conviction like those men. But my gut feeling is that I'd probably react more like Peter who at the time of the crucifixion and trial of Jesus, when the pressure was put on, when he was exposed, somebody said, you're one of them. Ah, whoa, not, no, 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 not me. Trying to preserve his own skin. When the blowtorch was applied, he caved in and swore and said, no, don't know him. Don't know the man, sorry, got the wrong person. Why do you believe what you believe? Have you got good reasons? In hard times, even in times of suffering, will you and I stand up? Let's pray. Father in heaven, just thank you for the Sabbath day, the time, the opportunity to come together to worship you, the God of the universe, the creator God the saving God, the life-giving God, the God who gives us, gives us every breath that we breathe, who gives us every blessing. Father, it's our privilege, it's our honour to come and worship you today, to be in your presence, to learn from your word, to be inspired, to be challenged. And Father, there's a whole lot of stuff going around that's seeking to discredit Christianity and the Bible and what it has to say. So, so much pressure out there, so much of a tidal wave of non-belief or unbelief. Father, please give us courage. Give us conviction. 
Give us the ability to learn and study and read for ourselves so that we know what we believe and we can give an answer to those who ask us. Father, thank you for your amazing love. Thank you for Jesus who came down to this earth to show us just how much you do love us. We accept that love. We're overwhelmed by that love. But Father, may we bask in that love and may we share that love with those that we come in contact with and meet is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.